Hello, this is Todd Luck, and this is a review, well, not really. This is going to be my thoughts on the rise of Ultraman from Marvel Comics. And the reason I say that is that this is a brand new number one issue that just came out, and it is 40 pages of story, it is $6 a piece, but it is so glacially paced that it is hard for me to say whether I like it or not, or whether I would recommend the series or not. The bottom line is you're probably going to need at least one more issue to even figure out if you like this series, to even get a baseline on what's going on. So it, it is, again, slowly paced. This, this gorgeous Alex Ross cover with Ultraman on it does not appear anywhere in this issue. You will read this, and if you are a new reader, you will have no idea what an Ultraman is. That's how slowly paced. This gets you about six minutes into the first episode if you're comparing it to the original series. <laughs> but that being said, I am going to talk about what is in here and give my thoughts on that. So, first of all, gorgeous, gorgeous Alex Ross cover. This is available as a poster without the, you know, the name and the, and the bar down here cluttering it up. So, if you buy this as a poster, I don't blame you. It is gorgeous. The interior artwork is quite different. It's kind of okay on the main story, which is going to be, you know, the ongoing art team here. Um, it's, I don't feel really passionate about it one way or the other. I think it's solid. I think it gets the job done. Some people are going to say, oh, it looks like anime. No, it, it doesn't. But it's still, you know, kind of a, a cartoonier style of art. Um, there's definitely some artists that I would have preferred on here, but there are definitely a lot of artists that I am glad are not on here. So this is solid. Um, just nothing that really gets me all that excited, but again, it gets the job done. It's, it's solid storytelling art. So as far as the story goes, let's just establish what this is not. This is not a continuation or anything related to the old show. There are names and designs and situations that are similar, but this is a complete reimagining of Ultraman. Not related in any way. It's written by Kyle Higgins or co-written by Kyle Higgins, um, who also did Power Rangers. So it's kind of a similar thing to what he did with Power Rangers, you know, except it's far more removed from the TV series or, or far less similarities between this concept and the original show. The first three pages is spent with a science patrol vessel crashing into Ultraman's ship in 1966. But this is not Hayata who is the pilot. This is actually uh, someone named Moriboshi. And if you're like me, you're like, wait, why are they calling Hayata Moriboshi? So who Moriboshi is, or presumably is, is that there was a sequel series to Ultraman called Ultra 7, and the hero there is called Dan Moriboshi. Now, the thing about Dan Moriboshi, and I've watched a few episodes of Ultra 7, uh, but from what I've read, Dan Moriboshi is not an alien who is inhabiting a human body. Dan Moriboshi is actually an Ultra who turned into a human form to disguise himself and assume the name Dan Moriboshi. So, in other words, this is a completely different Dan Moriboshi than Ultra 7. This is giving Dan Moriboshi the origin that Hayata had in the original series. However, it probably ended up being very different from whatever happened in those series is because... Because the Science Patrol is now a secret organization that protects the Earth from aliens and keeps the existence of extraterrestrials a secret. Yes, they've turned them into men in black. I hated it when this happened in the Netflix series. I'm not thrilled about it here. Um, and there are even more similarities in this one than in the Netflix series to Men in Black. So, yeah. But, you know, to, to give them a compliment, though, at least they didn't put them in business suits. They didn't put them in the men in black suits. So that's good. Um, and if you're wondering, like, like, why didn't they put them in something that looks like the Science Patrol? This is actually a modernized version of 
what the Ultra Squad wore in Ultra 7, which is, again, kind of weird. I wish they could have modernized it, but in a way that didn't make it look so generic, because this just looks like, you know, a million different other outfits for a science fiction-y type of organization. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of lines in the original costume. I, I wish they could have found a way to incorporate to give it its more distinctive look. Um, also, you'll notice that you're going to get these weird, like, whiteout things. At first, I thought this was a printing mistake, but this is actually supposed to show, like, re redaction in the information you're being given, but for some reason, they're doing it with whiteout instead of a black marker. Um, it's It really hits you kind of over the head, like, oh, my God, there's something s secret going on that could be sinister, and yes, there is. Um, because any government organization has to be sinister in some way. Yeah, we know. <laughs> you're going to be able to count the cliches. And honestly, you're, if you take a shot every time you see a similarity to Men in Black, you're going to be drunk by the end of this review. That includes sticking cadets with a stubby-looking weapon that has a surprising amount of firepower. That includes making people forget that they've seen extraterrestrials if they've witnessed the aliens. Um, I will say here, though, outside of the context of Men in Black, this is a little creepy because in Men in Black, what they do is if you've seen an alien, they'll just hold up a device, click a button, and there's a flash of light, and you'll forget about it. It's just like, hey, you saw an alien, Psh, now you have it, which seems honestly kind of innocent and unintrusive. Here they round people up and put them in neural pods, which sounds a lot more fascist, which maybe it's supposed to be, but I mean, the idea of like, you're gonna kidnap all the witnesses to a monster attack and shove them in a pod that's gonna reprogram their memories is just, it's, it's really fascist sounding. <laughs> One thing they do get right, though, is, yeah, they remember that they're supposed to have cool planes, so they get points for that. <laughs> there is a token monster fight, but it's pretty unexciting. It's just them shooting at this monster in a dark meat packing factory, and it's just there to establish their weapons and the characters, and that the monsters come from another dimension and kind of warp reality when they enter it. But it's not particularly exciting, most of this issue is spent establishing the characters of Fuji and Hayata, and these are modern-day characters that are, you know, I guess the equivalent of those characters in the original show. Hayata has washed out of the science patrol, but he still shows up and tries to fight the monsters anyway, even though he's not supposed to because he, he's, you know, young and rebellious, and yeah, I know, we've seen all this stuff before a million times. Uh, Fuji actually did make it into the science patrol, but she's questioning like some of their secretive stuff and she's trying to figure out things that, you know, don't seem quite right in the science patrol. So, yeah. And so the main story is 25 pages. And unfortunately, the only glimpse you get of Ultraman is a cryptic scene where you can't really make him out. He's obscured. And so it's really next issue you'll see him merge with Hayata and maybe do something? I don't know. It's very slowly paced, so I'm not sure when we'll actually get to see Ultraman be Ultraman. But um, the main story is 25 pages, so there is additional material in here. And so we have three pages of these little skits with, this is a character, um, he's known commonly as Pigman, um, he appears in several of the Ultra series, or a character inspired by him will appear in several of the Ultra series. Um, here it's kind of comedic and it kind of hints at some of the um, properties of the world that they live in and some of the things that might be going on at the Science Patrol. I didn't find them particularly funny, but they exist. So the highlight of the issue for me is this 10-page backup story on Ultra Q. Ultra Q was uh, the first Ultra series. It actually predates Ultraman, and it was basically a group that investigates paranormal phenomenon, 
And this story is in black and white to pay tribute to the fact that Ultra Q was a black and white TV series, and it's drawn by Frank Cho, and it looks freaking gorgeous. I love this artwork. It actually has um, an interesting story with a beginning, middle, and end, interesting fight scenes, an actual monster is in there. And it's just a pretty cool story. There's actually a twist at the end that makes it far more interesting than the um, main story. Um, and the twist sets up something in the main story. And unfortunately, it is another... It feels like it's another Men in Black reference. It feels like they really took one of the, a twist out of one of the movies and just completely ripped it off. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case. Maybe they haven't seen that particular Men in Black movie, but it still feels like we're, we're kind of working some very well-worn territory. Um, you're not going to see anything particularly original or that's going to blow you out of the water with this first issue. And so you may have seen Ed McGinnis's name on here, and all he does is this two-page splash that's showing you what's going to happen in future issues. I'm not sure why he's drawing it if he has nothing to do with the series. But um, I guess basically it's there to let you know, yes, uh, you will see Ultraman, and he will be fighting a monster, which I guess is something good after... Uh, nearly 40 pages of him not doing that <laughs> to assure readers of. And you can also see Ultra 7 there at the bottom fighting Ultraman. Hopefully it won't be like evil or something. I don't think that's where they're going with this, but um, stuff will happen. <laughs> we, we get reassurances. Things will actually happen in this series, hopefully before the end of it. So I really don't know what to say about you know, if you should buy this or not. I, I, I guess my recommendation would be if you love Ultraman like I do, pick this up, but be prepared to get at least one more issue to figure out if you like this or not. Um, me personally, there's so few Ultraman comics out there, I'm just going to get it whether it sucks or not. <laughs> so, but for everyone else, I, I mean, I'm just not sure. Like, if you don't know what Ultraman is and you pick up this issue... You're not going to know what Ultraman is by the end of it either, and you're not even going to see Ultraman, so I'm not sure how strong of a first issue this even is, but um, if, if you are among the uninitiated, if you have no idea what an Ultraman is, uh, let me know. I mean, did this first issue do anything for you? Um, and... While I'm at it, I also want to let people know what is available about Ultraman in the United States. I was reading an interview with the creators of the new uh, comic book, and they seem to be unaware of how many things have been released of Ultraman in the United States. So I just wanted to kind of go through some of the things I'm aware of. This is by no means a complete list. This is just things that I know about. So the 1966 original Ultraman series did see an English version release, and it reared in reruns in the 80s. I know that because I watched them and has several different DVD collections. Also in the 80s, Ultra 7 had an English release and there was an animated movie co-produced by Hanna-Barbera that had kind of a westernized team of ultras. It was called Ultraman The Adventure Begins and it was actually pretty good. Um, it actually has a team of ultras who operate out of Mount Rushmore. I'm not even kidding you guys. Y'all need to watch that. The 90s brought us Ultraman Towards the Future, which I've never had the pleasure of watching, but it did produce a really cool comic series. And these issues all have painted covers. This was actually the first American Ultraman comic. And the cool thing about this, the really cool thing about this miniseries is that not only does it have these gorgeous painted covers, it was drawn by the legendary Ernie Cohen and written by the legendary Dwayne McDuffie. And it is good, guys. I highly, highly recommend Honey Down, the original Ultraman miniseries. There was also a follow-up miniseries, also drawn by Ernie Cohen, but I didn't like the story as much. It had a different writer, but it still exists. 
In 2002, Ultraman Tiga aired in the United States, and unfortunately, I haven't got a chance to watch that one either, but it does seem really cool, and it did spawn a really cool comic book. This was actually a foreign comic book that Dark Horse reprinted, but it is gorgeous. Ultraman Tiga, the comic book, is one of the best looking comics I've ever gotten. I highly, highly recommend this miniseries. And that brings us up to the present day with the Netflix Ultraman series, and that is a CG animated series, and it's very different. It has an Ultraman who is human-sized, who uses an armor to fight monsters who are also human-sized. Um, if you want to see me rant about it for 30 minutes, you can check out my review. I had some very mixed feelings about it. And while I'm at it, this is a figure arts version of Ultraman, which is really awesome. Um, this is a really, really cool figure. It's expensive, and there's a lot of other alternatives if you're looking for Ultraman figures to put on your shelf. So that's it. I'll be reviewing the rest of the Marvel Ultraman series, and we'll see where it goes. Um, I have other reviews of other comics and some toy reviews as well. So like and subscribe for more videos, and until next time, see ya.